12. Julius found Sarantina not where he had expected. That expectation being that Cyrus' daughter would be assisting Old Diason with his task. Instead, the hunter discovered the dark-haired woman sitting where she could see the proceedings, but was far enough away not to be part of them. Her eyes were, of course, on Old Diason. To ask otherwise would have been unthinkable, even to Achilles. Although as the archer approached, his own keen gaze noticed her surreptitiously shift to Lila, then back to the son of Domitz again. I brought you some water, he said as way of interjecting himself into her private world. He offered her the sack he had carried with him freshly filled at Master Ethan's estate. Ever practical, save when it came to love, Achilles had first paused to gather something to drink before chasing after his friend. Serenthina took it with a nod of thanks. She drank far more from it than Achilles assumed that she would, which meant that she had been sitting out here for quite some time was watching. Likely, Serenthina had run all the way here, fearing some imagined danger, or else he had taken his time, somehow aware that old Dyson was utterly safe. When she was done, he took the sack back and remarked, it's truly astonishing, isn't it, Sari? It is. I've been his friend since we were children. Without asking, he took up a place next door. If it was as forward as he dared to get. Despite his sometimes Gregor's appearance, Achilles was much more at home in the forest alone with his quarry. Social circumstances? He felt only one step above Mandolin, and where the woman next to him was concerned, as awkward. His comment caused her to look at him with such intensity that Achilles wondered what he had said wrong. Serentina appeared poised to say something, but it was almost a full minute before a single word escaped her lip. And when she did speak, it was not the subject that he assumed it would be. Why are the two of you friends of Chilios? You seem so different in so many ways. He had no answer save. Because we just are. I guess we were friends the moment that we met. He shrugged. Children are like that. I suppose. Serenthina thought for a moment, then asked, Is she what you could have dreamed of? Now, the subject he had expected was at hand. Serenthina had merely taken a more circuitous route to it. Oh, Isla? She's fair, to be honest. And no man would let his gaze pass over her without noticing that. But the same could be said for others, not merely her. He could barely have been more blunt in his eyes, but she sensed not to understand that he meant her. I know that to us, she is exotic, and I can understand why old Dyson will fall for her. It was all so quick, Achilles. It can be like that. It had been like that for him. In a sense, one day he had known only Sari, the impish child. The next day, there stood a beautiful woman. Achilles had been so lost in amazement of the change of that, for the next week he went without a single catch to his credit. Serentina was silent for a time and Achilio satisfied himself with being in her company, which was how such situations generally ended. They watched 
as all dies and greeted one Parthen after another. Each time he succeeded in doing whatever it was he did. Achilles noticed both his friend and the one touched shared a look of immense satisfaction. Is that the way you felt? He finally dared ask Serentina. Like them? Yes. But the way she said it made the hunter not so certain. Have you been able to do anything? This time, there was a pause, followed by... I don't know. How could you? Her tongue grew more adamant. I don't know. Normia Chillus would have left it at that, but this time he could not. Sorry, what do you mean? Her gaze shifted not to him, but rather her hands. I feel it. Just as I know many of them do. That's all. I haven't noticed anything else different around me. I've tried to think of things, make them happen, but, but as far as I know, nothing has. Still, I would have thought by now that, now she looked at him, her eyes were steely. So would I. Believe me, so would I. It made no sense to him. Lila had already displayed several instances of ability, such as making flowers and berries bloom on bushes, or healing some minor cuts suffered by one of the mounts. She had also summoned a rabbit to them, saving Achilles from having to hunt, but leaving the archer feeling as if somehow the animal had been cheated of its chance to survive. What about you? His companion asked without warning. I haven't seen anything from you, either. In truth, Chilos did feel something within him seeking to grow, but he had done his best to smother it. He had told no one of that decision. Many might desire the gift that Eldias and offered, but not his best friend. Achilles was satisfied with being who he was, a hunter and a simple man. I suspect I'm not the best student for Eldias and he returned. Not at all. But no one taught him. Not really. With old Dyson, it came as suddenly as the storm over Serum. Which apparently was caused by him too. Old Dyson was pressed on all sides, Sari. He was accused of brutal murder by Brother Machilios. The Inquisitors would have dragged him back to the cathedral. Probably to burn as a fiend. He had no choice. She was not convinced. It was all terrible. But why at that time? Why not when his family slowly and horribly perished from plague? Why not then? Why even him for that matter? There are so many others who've suffered worse and yet we've never heard of such an astounding thing before. It would have even reached Serum. You know that. Even as he nodded his agreement to his argument, Serenthina went on. And why not Mendelin then? He suffered as much, too. His family was wiped out, and his brother was accused of terrible crime. It could have been him, but it wasn't. I've seen nothing unusual about Mendelin. Have you? Her mention of Mendelin made a chilly little splinch. Serenthina noticed his reaction, and her eyes narrowed. What is it, Achilles? What about Mendelin? Is he manifesting abilities like his brother? It was not the suggestion of that which had caused the archer to flinch, but rather a brief and unexpected recollection of another time, another place. As Serenthina had spoken of old Dice and sibling, Achilles had relieved the moment when he and his other friend had inspected the mysterious stone near Serum. Not only had the archer seen again Mendelin freezing a place before it, but he had also re-experienced touching it himself. The awful emptiness that had overwhelmed him until he had managed to pull free. No. Chilius finally managed. No. Nothing like old Iason. 
She was not convinced. Chilios, what? Without a warning, a tremendous sense of fear overcame the hunter. But not fear for himself. He had the awful feeling that something was happening to Mandolin at this very moment. Achilles slipped to his feet, startling his companion. What is it? What's wrong? He wanted to answer her, but the urgency he felt was too strong. Without a word, Achilles began running. He ignored Serentina's concerned call after him. But barely out of sight of the woman he loved, Achilles came to a dead stop. The fear for Mandolin had not yet lessened any, but the archer hesitated to begin his run anew. The truth was, Achilles had no idea just where Old Eisen's brother had gone. The streets through which Mendelin moved were oddly empty, and the buildings around him had suddenly taken on an unsettling gray cast. There was no wind whatsoever, and not the slightest sound. Mendelin would have felt very alone, save for one thing. He was still surrounded by the shades of the guards. Old Dyson had it slain. Since their arrival, it had taken monumental effort on his part to keep from screaming out the truth to the others. Either these shadows of men existed, or he had gone mad. Or both. Mendelin did not know which would be worse. He only knew that he just wanted to tell someone what was happening to him. But he did not. He had said nothing, even when they had arrived in Partha, where his hopes that the ghosts would leave him had dissipated the moment the first of the shades had passed through into the town. Until then, Menelan had believed that his haunting would be temporary. Now he feared that the dead would always be with him. Fear was perhaps no longer the right word, though. Certainly they kept him anxious, but the more they were around him, the less frightened he became. They did nothing but stare, not in condemnation, but as if awaiting word from him. So far, though, Mendelin had said little directly to them. He had asked them to please kindly go away, but since they had not obeyed, he had no reason to continue any further attempt at conversation. At the moment, they were the least of his concerns. As he continued through the town, Mendelin began noticing peculiar signs of age on the buildings, as if Partha were some ancient place long abandoned. The shift became more apparent with each step. The grayness grew darker, veering toward the black. This was not right, he realized. Where was everyone? Where was old Dyson? After whom? He'd been chasing. Mendelin was worried about his brother, especially what the Parthians might do. He recalled too vividly what had happened in Serum, where people who had known Old Dyson all his life had turned on him. But then there arose a sight ahead that made Mendelin falter in his steps and forget all about his brother. He spun around with the intention of fleeing, only to find himself facing the very direction he had just abandoned. A direction that led to a long-neglected cemetery. A cemetery that, from its ancient state, surely could not be Parthas. With the shades of dead men already surrounding him, Old Dyson's brother could see nothing but ill coming of entering the overgrown burial site. Yet, when he tried to back away, the cemetery only drew nearer. Nevertheless, Mendelin tried one more step back, and in the next breath found himself standing within the ruined grounds. A choking sound was all he could muster as he tried to come to grips with what was happening. He prayed that it was only a bad dream, but he knew otherwise. Mendelin then thought of his blackouts 
and wondered if this was some bizarre continuation of them. He certainly had no other answer. He suddenly noticed another very curious and unsettling thing. The shades of the dead guards had not entered with him. They drifted beyond the arched gateway, as if the winged gargoyle he saw above it kept them at bay. For the first time, Menelin would have liked their company, if only because of their comparative familiarity. Now he was completely alone, facing who knew what. As he started to turn his gaze back, what felt like a hand pushed him deeper into the cemetery. Stumbling several steps, Mandolin glanced over his shoulder. He immediately swallowed. Naturally, there was no one there. The farmer glanced down at the first of the graves. A crescent-shaped stone marked the spot. The grave had been dug so long ago that it was infested with generations of weeds and grass and had even sunken in a bit. Madeline started to look away again, then eyed the marker one more time. Barely, barely legible in the odd gray shadows was the same script they had seen on the stone near Serum. Despite himself, Madeline grew fascinated by the revelation. Keeping respectful to the grave, he knelt to the side, then leaned toward the stone. Up close, Mendelin was able to verify what he had seen. Many of the very same symbols ran along the crescent, but in patterns that he did not recognize. Without hesitation, he ran his fingers over the first line. Immediately, he sensed some sort of power emanating from the symbols. Mendelin had heard of words of power, such as the mage clans supposedly used at times, and he could only surmise that these were such. Looking up, Old Dyson's brother surveyed the seemingly endless field of stones. The graves were marked in a variety of manners. In addition to the crescents, there were star-shaped slabs, squat rectangular ones, and more. Surveying the landscape ahead, Mendelin even spotted one overlooked by a towering winged statue bearing a weapon in one hand. Drawn by that statue, he slipped among the graves in order to get a better look. Fascination replaced the dread. He had to learn more. Was this some, some repository for the dead of the mage clans? If so, did they have some tie to what was happening to him, and to Old Dyson for that matter? Until now, he would have doubted it. What little he had gleaned from merchants indicating that the once powerful clans had all but shut themselves off from the world, as they continued their arcane duels of wit against one another. They would hardly have the time to bother themselves with a pair of farmers far from the city. Although the statue stood deep in the cemetery, it seemed that Mandolin had barely begun toward it when suddenly it loomed over him. He paused, trying to understand what it was supposed to be. A winged being with a face hooded, save for glimpses of the mouth and some cascading hair. It wore a robe and breastplate somewhat akin to that of the cathedral's inquisitors, but sculpted to resemble some finer material. The breastplate also had script upon it, more words in the same mysterious language. Mendelin glanced at the wings again, realizing that they were different from those of birds. What he had taken for feathering looked, when studied closer, more of an artist's rendition of flame. Mendelin had never heard legends of any creature or spirit with such wings, not even in the stories his mother had told him when he had been a very young child. In the giant's figure's left hand, it held a great sword, whose tip rested on the base beneath the statue. The other hand pointed down, not merely, it seemed to Mandolin, indicating the grave beneath, but also those around it. 
he had the distinct impression that this was supposed to mean something to him. But what? Well, Dyson's brother could not say. And so, despite his situation, Mendelin grew frustrated beyond belief. He was a patient man in general, but someone appeared to be trying, very successfully, to draw him past his limits. All right then, he shouted, his voice echoing over and over and over in the silence. If you want something from me, then tell me what it is. Tell me, I demand it. The moment that he finished, a grating sound filled his ears. Swallowing, Mendelin watched in horror as the statue's pointing hand torn enough so that it now indicated what was written on the base. Mandolin waited for it to do something else, but the winged guardian froze once more. Slowly, he built up the nerve to look down at what it was below. The same ancient script greeted him. He had hardly expected otherwise, but still, this added to his frustration. But I cannot read it, he muttered. I don't know what any of it says. Squinting, Mendelin attempted to recall the words that had come unbidden to him that frightening time when the demon had caught him alone in the woods. He remembered the images in his head and the sounds of those words, but they were still not enough to help Mendelin with what now lay before him. Weary of the futility of this nightmare, Mendelin finally dared lean on the grave as he studied each mark. His mouth formed shapes, but that was all. Nothing absolutely, nothing made sense. What does it say? He growled under his breath. What does it say? The dragon has chosen you. Mendelin jerked to his feet. He had heard a voice like that once before, back in Serum. It was akin to the voice of Cyrus. Cyrus, after he had been killed. Part of him wanted to scream for this new one to get out of his head, but another part fixed on what had been said. The dragon has chosen you. He stared at the ancient script and read it anew. The dragon has chosen me. You. The. Dragon. Has. Chosen. You. And suddenly Old Dyson's brother could read that line. More important, other symbols now made more sense. Mendel felt that he was now on the verge of discovering the meanings of all of them, and, in doing so, discovering the truth about what was happening. But what did the phrase actually relate to? Kneeling close again, Mendelin studied the symbol representing the most important word, dragon. A loop twisting into itself, a thing without beginning or end. Mendelin knew what a dragon was from legends. Why would this mark represent such a creature? And why such a creature at all? What happened? Mandolin quietly asked, then frowned when he noted how he had phrased the question. He had meant to ask, what is happening? Why would he... The dirt beneath his hand suddenly shifted, as if something beneath was seeking to dig its way out. Eyes round, Mendelin scrambled back. In doing so, he inadvertently threw himself atop another of the graves, where, to his further dismay, something also began to stir beneath. Worse, it began to register on him that the graves everywhere were shifting, stirring, Mounds of upturned dirt decorated many already, and Mendelin's imagination pictured skeletal fi figures ready to emerge. But just as it seemed that his imagination would become a monstrous reality, 
there formed in the shadow of the winged statue a figure entirely shrouded in black. Mendelin had a momentary glimpse of a face not unlike his own, in that it was studious nature, but otherwise very, very different. It had an unreal handsomeness to it, as only a sculpture or a painting could achieve. The figure drew a single symbol in the air, a dagger-like mark for a single blink flared a bright white. What sounded like a great sigh swept through the cemetery. The grave stilled. The cloaked form vanished. And at that point, Mendelin's surroundings changed. He was still in Partha. That much even his jolted mind would have guessed. But old Dyson's brother no longer stood within the cemetery. Instead, Mendelin was poised at its gateway. The gargoyle's grinning maw seeming to mock his sanity. The cemetery no longer looked ancient and overrun, but well kept, as one would have expected in Partha. But no matter how hard he squinted, Mendelin could see no winged statue. Something touched his shoulder, causing him to yelp like a kicked hound. Strong fingers grasped Mendelin and turned him around. To his relief, it was Achilles, not some fiend from the dead. Madeline! Are you alright? What are you doing out here? The hunter looked almost as pale as old Dyson's brother felt. Achilles' eyes darted past Madeline to study the cemetery with other loathing. Did you go in there? I? No! It seemed best to Mendelin not to try to explain since he himself was not quite certain just what had taken place. A delusion? A dream? Insanity? Instead, Mendelin focused on a new and intriguing question. Achilles, my friend, why are you here? Did you follow me? This time, it was the archer who hesitated before replying with an equally suspicious... Yes, I did. Achilles gave Mendelin a sudden grin, then slapped the farmer on the shoulder. Didn't want you getting lost, eh, Mendelin? A town this size? Lots of things to distract you, hmm? Mendelin was not certain whether he was supposed to be insulted by such comments, but chose to ignore them for the sake of both men. Perhaps another time he would share his secrets with Achilles, and the hunter could do the same with him. Those secrets, he believed, all focused on the fateful stone back home. You need to come back with me to the square, old Dyson. It's Shane Menglin that he had not been concerned about his brother. Nervously rubbing his hands together, he blurted, Old Dyson! Is he alright? More than that, replied Achilles. Well, you'll have to see to understand. He happened to look down at Menglin's hands. His brow arched. Your hands are covered in dirt. What? I tripped in the streets just before here and had to use my hands to keep from striking the stone with my face. Mendeline quickly explained. There was dirt there, he added rather lamely. To his relief and surprise, the blonde bowman took his answer at face value. A fall in the street? You're getting too absent-minded for your own good. Here, let's find something to wipe your hands off with and let's be on our way. With nothing else around, Mendelin finally had to brush his hands against his garments. As a farmer, he was used to doing such, but felt a little embarrassed to be seen so in Partha. Yet they could not very well return to Master Ethan's home first. Mendelin dearly wanted to see what was happening in the square. He started to follow Achilles, only to falter but a few steps later. Making certain that his friend was not looking his way, Mendelin spun in a quick circle, searching. The ghosts, who had been with him since the battle in the wild, were nowhere to be found. It was as if that, when the shrouded figure had sent the spirits of the graves to their rest. It had also done the same for the shades of the temple's guards. Thank you, he whispered. Did you say something? Asked the archer, pausing to let him catch up. No, 
Manolin replied with a vigorous shake of his head. No. Achilles took his answer as he had the others, for which old Dice's brother was grateful. Yet as they hurried along, Manolin's mind stayed not with his sibling situation, but the unsettling, indeed even sinister, episode through which he had just suffered. One thing about it haunted him most of all. Not what happened. Not exactly. No, it was a new question that the strange vision had raised. Or rather, two new questions bound together. What was the dragon? And why had it chosen him? Despite Achilles' genial appearance, his mood was actually darker than when he had gone off in search of Mendelin. The archer had not at all expected to discover old Dice's brother standing at the very entrance to such a place. It had brought back full blown for the second time the horrific sensations that Achilles had suffered after touching the stone. He had tried to cover up his abrupt anguish immediately and was thankful that Mandolin had been so preoccupied that he had not noticed. Unfortunately, that preoccupation had drawn the hunter's attention in turn, and was what ate away at Achilles even now. When asked if he had entered the cemetery, Mandolin had denied doing such a thing. Yet Achilles did not have to have a master hunter's honed senses to know that the dirt on the other's hands was not what had been found on the street. It had a drier consistency, an aged look, and there had been bits of weed and grass mixed in too. The sort of dirt that would have been more likely found very easily in a cemetery. That, in turn, caused Achilles to remember another time back in Serum, when Brother Machilius had wished to see the grave of the murdered missionary and had proclaimed to the archer and the others that there was someone who had desecrated it. The Master Inquisitor had believed Old Diason somehow responsible, Old Diason or someone near to him. And now, here was Mandolin at another cemetery with dirt on his hands. Mandolin, who had been curiously absent during much of the events in the village. Mandolin, who in some ways was beginning to frighten Achilles even more than Old Dyson.